My name is Carl Moberg. I am the CTO over here at Avassa in Stockholm. Brought with me today here my trusted colleague Fredrik Jonsson to show you um, a couple of demos or a demo here. And the this demo here is what that we're going to show you how to manage a distributed edge. Now, we needed to make this come alive. So we needed to come up with some industry or some setup that would make sense to most living people across the globe, while also, of course, fulfilling the idea of having a distributed environment. What better than a movie theater company? So this whole demo is actually wrapped around the idea that we are a movie theater company. So let me present to you the IT department of Movie Theater Corporation. Um, they've already started complaining about salaries and, 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 and work times and, and many things like that. But uh, we're now on point here, team, to actually deliver on the challenges for this, for this company here. So I'm, I'm happy to have you, Fredrik and I are very happy to have you. Let's go, as they would say. Here's the background. We have 100 plus movie theaters across the globe in the weirdest of places because we're mostly showing French New Wave and science fiction. So we're off the beaten path, really, really cool and exotic locations. Our current in-theater infrastructure is about three PCs per location running one Windows instance and one application each, and they're all updated by USB stick. You may laugh, but it's insane how many users we have met that have that kind of infrastructure in their distributed locations. We, on the other hand, we're a modern team. So we understand that running one application per computer is not a good thing, it's a bad thing. And we need a distributed edge cloud based on general compute that can satisfy the needs for our kind of rapid iteration on the applications that we need to run in each theater location. So we're gonna refresh our in-theater compute and application management system and join us, would you, as we uh, move ahead with that. There's a couple of invariants. That's always true for IT departments, right? It's full of living, breathing people with a background. There are three important things for us that really impacts the way we need to think about this. Our in-house development team that builds these precious software components that needs to run in our theaters, they live in GitLab. They build, test, and deploy container applications out of GitLab. And we will not be able to convince them to do anything otherwise. It works for them. It works to deploy for, to the public cloud. So why couldn't we make this work uh, towards the edge? Our operations team think of themselves as even further ahead. They monitor and observe applications from AWS CloudWatch. Same thing here. They see no particular reason to leave that. And they can't understand why they couldn't keep observing applications, both running in the public cloud, as well as on the edge with the same tool set. So we'll see if we can meet that. And here come, comes a little bit of a head spinner. Our strategy team has said this, look, we're in the movie theater business. We're not so sure we want to develop, deploy, and manage applications over time. We actually want our software vendors to do that, but on our infrastructure. So we get that resilience and autonomy and those neat ping times. So we're going to work with one of, one of our vendors to allow them in as a tenant in our little edge cloud here and allow them themselves to deploy and manage their applications again on our edge um, system here. Those, these are things that we have to fulfill guys. So we have to work really hard, maybe pick a vendor. You probably understand which one uh, to see if we can meet these requirements. So we've made a super simplified general requirements list here. Low toil operations of distributed uh, management layer, full life cycle management of containers. We wanna reuse, as I mentioned before, the existing tools and processes. We want to be able to observe in a granular fashion, both metrics and events per application. We are going to allow tenant access to our first software development partner, Ticket Blipper Corporation. Really cool stuff. They are very forward-looking Ticket Blipper software that they uh, deploy several times a day, actually, uh, because they're DevOps. And we need secure lifecycle management of sensitive site and application data because we might get broken into and they may steal important data out of our out of our sites here. So we'll see if we can actually fulfill this list of requirements through some demo magic here. And just to kind of reduce what I understand to be, of course, a little confusing switch when we go from my beloved PowerPoint into a web browser to start with, we're gonna use an instance of the control tower managed 
through our Avasta Cloud Platform. We're just going to briefly show you the Avasta Cloud Platform, but swiftly move into the actual control tower, the actual product UI. All the compute Linux and Docker runtimes are pre-installed on all 100 plus sites. So our, our very um, good infrastructure team has already done that. So we're ready to go with our infrastructure. We're going to use three types of interfaces, as I mentioned, web UI, API, and a command line tool throughout. throughout. So we'll flip a little back and forth here. And we'll start out being what could be called a super admin. So the first thing person or kind of person we're going to log in as has full control over both the sites and also has the ability to, to deploy applications. So we're going to use this for most of the steps, but not all. OK, so demo time. Are you getting ready, Frederick? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Excellent. You're on mute, too. So that's, that's great. Um, now, here's what's going to happen here. Um, we're going to look at our newly started control tower through ACP. We're going to install edge enforcers on three hosts as we create a new site here in Stockholm. We're going to prepare the control tower to receive call home and send config to the newly arrived sites and make them um, actually behave as a site. We're going to watch the call home because we like watching uh, terminals and we'll talk about what happens in those terminals. And we're going to eventually onboard the rest of our 100 plus sites through the API using a little script that we have received from our inventory team. And with that, I think we're ready to do our first switch over to demo, Frederick. Thank you, Carl. So as Carl mentioned, uh, we're in the browser. We're in the Avasa Cloud Platform, uh, where I have recently spun up uh, what's going to be our production environment for, for our movie theater company. Um, so uh, a brief thing to, to mention is that this URL is something that we will ask our uh, sites to call home to. Um, and if I click over here, it will actually take me into the control tower UI uh, for this specific environment. So by clicking this button, I'm actually leaving the cloud platform and going into control tower for the movie theater company. And it looks like this. It's pretty empty. We don't have any sites yet. Uh, as you can see, we only have the control tower by itself. Uh, so before we, we start uh, installing the sites, I just want to briefly mention what you see here. So uh, applications and deployments is where we're going to uh, work later when we start deploying uh, our applications. Uh, registries to make a connection to GitLab, where we store all our software in the, in the movie theater company. Uh, Strongbox is for, as Carl mentioned, for secrets, uh, for distributing secrets to applications across the sites. And finally, the tenants tab is where we will uh, onboard the Ticket Blipper Corporation. So just a quick intro. And, and again, we will go through all these more in detail later on. But now let's uh, install the Stockholm site. Uh, brace yourself. Uh, there will be terminal. Here we go. So what you see right here is three uh, computers running Ubuntu Linux. They have uh, container D and Docker installed, as Carl mentioned. And I'm going to use a, a small installation script, uh, same script on all sites. Uh, and I'm just going to tell that script to call back to our api.production movie theater corp avasa.net. The same address uh, where we host the control tower. So, by running these three here, you can see that it it uh, downloads the software, uh, installs it, and starts it. And the first thing I I need to do here is take a look at this. So these are host IDs, and each host ID uniquely. Uh, identifies uh, this hardware or this virtual machine that I've installed the software on. So I'm going to need to hold on to this one uh, because later on when we configure the Stockholm site uh, in the control tower, I'm going to need to tell it uh, what hosts are allowed to call home and what hosts are part of the different sites. So I'll make a note of that one. Uh, 
same for this guy. And then lastly, this one. And then I'll start looking at the logs. And I won't bore you with this too long, but it's, it's, um, here we go. I just briefly want to point out here that, as you can see, they're calling home to the control tower, but the control tower doesn't recognize them. So it basically hangs up and says, come back, which they do pretty quick. But they're calling home uh, repeatedly and, and trying to get access. So to give them access, I'm going to switch back. I'm going to tell the system uh, I'm going to create a new site, the Stockholm site. So I'll start by giving it a name. Stockholm. I'll put in uh, some location information right down here. Just gonna paste that in to put it on the map and could potentially be used oops, uh, for scheduling application based on, on locality. The next important things, uh, thing is labels. Uh, and we use labels. I think this will make more sense when we start deploying applications, but we match site labels. So we say this application should run on sites uh, matching these labels. So in this setup, in, in the movie theater company, we use two labels. So we put a country label uh, in there and we also put a region label. So Stockholm is in Europe, so I'll put those in. And here comes the host part. So by telling the system I have a new host and start adding the host IDs that I copied before, like this one, two, and the last one, three, like this. I'm telling the system that these, these three hosts that I call home, please accept them and make them part of the Stockholm site. So I'll, I'll click save here. And then I'll just briefly go back here and we should see things happening here. Hey, can I ask you a quick question? Um, so it has nothing to do with the wireless space, but in, on the wireless side, what happens is whenever we deploy a new access point and we stick it out in the world, there's a couple of different ways that it does it and that it calls home. And the easiest way that we've seen uh, isn't copying and pasting a big old, you know, 20 digit number, but it does is it calls home and it gives me a list of all the ones that are waiting for entry. And I just check off and I hit approve, approve, approve. Are there any, I mean, I know this is super early on with you all, but just, you know, train a thought there. It's like, it's way easier if I have, if I'm deploying a site and again, this is not my arena at all, but I'm thinking about it from the outside perspective. If I'm trying to get a tech at a movie theater to do this for me while I sit at the master location, I don't want them to have to copy and paste and do all this other stuff. I want them to say, hey, just go double click this file or run this file and then I'll approve and I'll let it in. Any, any thoughts on that, just out of curiosity? Uh, this is actually one of the topics that we didn't think would actually take over entire meetings <laughs> with users. <laughs> Uh, people have very, very uh, strong. <laughs> what happens when you throw users so, into the mix? It really so messes it all up, right? <laughs> it, it does reveal, Drew, that you have some operational background, um, and, and track roles might actually be on your on your CV. Um, there are very strong opinions here. I will definitely say number one that is actually on our feature list. That's actually on the roadmap. Um, the hard part with that, though, is that well, we will provide several ways of doing this. Let's just say. The hard part with that one is to how do you actually ensure the provenance of that, right? So there's going to have to be phone calling to say, did you actually put that in? Is this not a third party, you know, a malicious thing? How can I tell? Well, it's a phone call, probably. Um, but for the lighter weight and for the less extreme environments, that's going to be fine. That's going to be just fine. Because it works, it works exceptionally well with access points, right? Where Because you're taking... You're going out to to a site in you know in the middle of nowhere, and you're just shipping the equipment out there. And you're you're the instructions for the technician are just plug it in, and we'll take it from there. And yeah. I know this is software; it's a little bit different in the sense that you're deploying. You know, but why does it have to be? You know what I no. mean? That's uh, a good point. It's a good point. Um, it's a kind of worms, and I will say that, of course, the, <laughs> the, the 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 poor man's way of doing this, as you can imagine, is actually tailing the logs 
on the control tower because it's going to repeatedly say, I just denied this whole idea. Yeah. Idea. So the problem is, that. is I see a whole lot of CLI, right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, we're looking at this, I'm like, man, that's a lot of text, you know, like how do we figure out how to do this without having these walls <laughs> of text in front of us? But I get no, it. Right. I mean, and welcome to Tech Field Day. As you know, this is the can of worms and we are all specialists at opening cans of worms. So that's what we're here for. <laughs> can of worm field day. I love your can of worms, bro. Keep, keep counting those worms. Awesome. <laughs> Cool. You good, uh, you good to continue? Oh, yeah. So just briefly before we, we leave the, the, the wall of text. Uh, yeah. So so uh, I see by, by looking at the logs here, Strongbox ready, the, the, the hosts are now in a state where the, the services that Carl mentioned, uh, Strongbox for security, registry, and all of that is up and running. And these three hosts has formed the cluster. They are now the Stockholm site. And to further uh, look at that, I can go in back in here and I can, I, so I went from config to the state. Uh, first thing I'll, I'll point out since we're gonna use that, we also add a few system labels. So system type edge means it's a site and obviously the name. Then as the hosts call home, uh, they report information about themselves that we can use in scheduling applications. So SMBIOS stuff, uh, how much memory, how many vCPUs, what operating system are you running, and so forth. And uh, everything I did uh, through, the, through the forms here uh, can of course be done through the APIs, which is what we will do for the next 100 plus sites. So what I'm gonna do is through a script, uh, given host IDs that were given to me uh, by our infrastructure team, I'm going to uh, basically push uh, definitions like these uh, through, the, through the APIs. So let me real quick go here. I'll call my script called register sites. And as it does that, you can see, let's actually do this. Let's fly out a bit. You can actually see uh, sites coming in uh, from all over the world, where we're going to show those sci-fi movies. And the French New Wave. And not the French forget. New Wave. Not to forget. Not to forget. Yeah. Uh, same thing with these ones. Uh, for a while, they're uninitialized uh, because they haven't called home yet. Uh, if we look at this, uh, all of a sudden, they come alive. And each of these, as I mentioned before, have their tags. Uh, and the information we read about uh, read uh, about them. So 100 plus sites uh, onboarded, ready to go. It would be interesting. You know, I'm thinking about deploying 100 sites. I've, I've deployed 100 servers in one go, and there's a lot of stuff that I expect to know in advance. And I'm wondering if there's a possibility of having like GOIP uh, tagging by default for these sites rather than having to put in Stockholm or uh, Susangu or uh, even Oakland, um, even if even if half of them are accurate, you know, I'm in Sunnyvale, my GOIP is St. Louis for some reason, thanks AT&T. <laughs> but even if I can save 150 of those 300 manual taggings, that saves me at least 20 minutes, maybe two hours, I don't know. Oh, there, yeah, that's another nice juicy can of worms. So, 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 so two things. The data that we provided manually now um, obviously came out of Frederick's head, or actually a, a paste buffer. Um, if we can glean that from somewhere else, we'll be more than happy to. GOIP sounds like a fine idea for actually, for example, tagging them, right? Um, and there are many other sources of interesting information in a super distributed environment that you can pick up and assign as labels or otherwise to each of these sites. So I think that sounds like a stellar idea in connecting GOIP services and allowing for you know, semantic or otherwise you know, interesting tagging of the assets that are incoming. So as you don't have to do that in an Excel sheet, which is I'm sure what our inventory management team is using um, at this point. Um, so it's an excellent point and we are super eager to kind of explore how to hook into those kinds of systems. And how that can make, like you said, how we can reduce the toil 
because, well, let, let me start by saying did that answer your question? I, that, that's probably a loaded question in and of itself if I answered your question, but let, let me try it. Did I answer your question? Yes, I think that was sufficient. Thank you. <laughs> good. Happy to, happy to have reached sufficient. So I think that was a good first demo here. And I think as an IT team, we can all agree, um, at least uh, this far, that we've been able to check out the low toil operations of a distributed container management layer by in under a couple of minutes, deploying and making ready a 100 plus site distributed edge cloud, um, minus the time it takes, of course, to install the Linux operating system in the container. But we're now up and running and this distributed edge cloud is actually ready to start taking applications. So we're gonna move on towards that. Yes, a question there before, and, and you, sure. you might you might get to it later on down the road. But I'm thinking about I'm thinking about all these locations, and let's say they're existing movie theaters. There's family owned movie theaters that have been rolled into the corporate you know location, and they've got this awesome Pentium Pro computer with a you know with an old hard drive in it, and yeah. you know cigarette smoke in the fan, and all the <laughs> other stuff. Is there from from um, from looking at the resources that are available on that machine and being able to reuse it by saying, hey, you don't have to swap it out, just you know, put this floppy disk in and you know, run setup.bat or whatever it is. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was funny. But if you, you know, if you <laughs> if you have an, an old machine that's being reused or an old server or whatever it is at that location, does this not just the installer stack, but the the enforcer? The lightweight enforcer does it monitor those resources to make sure like hey you're not going to overrun this hard drive or you know this computer won't work for what you're trying to do and again these are strangely outside of the realm questions i get that but i'm curious because that's like that's kind of real world you know oh absolutely and you would be surprised maybe when i say that the type of hardware that you're talking about is prevalent in healthcare actually <laughs> oh no not, <laughs> not surprised at all <laughs> Minus the cigarette, I think, Ash, at least uh, maybe in Southern Europe. But you see what I mean? So um, as long as we can reliably read up the resources from the hardware through the operating system, which is kind of what Frederick showed with the DMI and SM BIOS, we get a good grasp of what's available to us. And we can both you know, limit the resource usage of the applications and also, for example, place applications that require particular set of resources or not, depending on what's what's available. So yes, as, as long as it's available to us, and that's usually through Linux though. So that, that'll be my one thing to say is that for now in this generation, we assume Linux, we assume a container runtime. But as long as that holds true, we're, we're fine. And we see a lot of people with, let's, let's just call it heterogeneous sites. Um, they are not, the computers are not the same um, and they are not from the same generation. And that's fine too. Um, scheduling becomes more interesting, uh, but that's fine too. 